please, and turn to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, which is our text for the morning. But I want to talk to you first about the whole issue of simplicity. And we're looking at these spiritual disciplines, and there are some that are obvious, fasting and prayer, or a couple that, that I knew of uh, growing up even. The discipline of simplicity is not one that I would have thought of, and I uh, as I was studying it, I thought it was really a beautiful discipline that fits together with the others. Simplicity is freedom. It's the opposite of duplicity. A simple person is open and transparent and not plagued by fear or foreboding. You know, contemporary culture is fractured and fragmented. It's anxious and it's annoyed. Society beckons us with competing attachments and traps us into a perpetual crisis mode because we're always concerned with what others think about us, or did I do this right, or did I forget to, to take care of that part? And you know what I'm talking about, that's life. The expectations at work are almost overwhelming. And on top of everything, of the things that we hear at work, and maybe you're not in the workforce anymore, but there's so many expectations society says, this is what a good grandparent is like, and, and this is what a good child is like, and this is what a good citizen should do. And there's so many competing voices and so many possible choices. And sometimes you feel like, stop the merry-go-round, I want to get off. And we have so many things, and our sense of security seems to derive from what we have and, and who we know. And I see it all the time, and working with the city officials, there's some people that have titles, and, and, and when that person is in the room, others behave differently, and it, it bothers me because I know that person without the title. And why would the mayor be any more significant to you than the guy that, that cleans up the streets? I mean, I'd, I'd rather have somebody plowing my streets than, than, you know, giving me speeches. Why do we do that? Why do we focus on what we wear and, and what we look like and what we drive? And as a society, we certainly do. And the discipline of simplicity starts in the inside, but it's visible on the outside because it affects what we do every day. And you can't have a discussion about this discipline without looking at the, the preoccupation in our society with money and stuff. Americans have a vested interest in affluence. And you might say, that's not me, Pastor. And I would say, oh, it is you. Because if you, if you have to choose every morning between what you're going to wear to work, and if you get to choose what you want for supper, you are wealthier than 90% of the world. Uh, we say, well, I'm wealthy in, in love, and I'm wealthy in freedom, but not wealthy financially. You're wealthy financially as well. We are. And so we live in a society of, of affluence. And the things that we want, let's be honest, we get. If I want something, I'm able to find a way to do it. It might take me a little longer, might not be quite as shiny, but I can get what I want. And so we have so many things, so many uh, things that are pulling our attention, and the simple life frees us from our desire for more. It releases us from worrying about what we already have and enables us to live the kind of life to which we have been called. The discipline of simplicity affects everything. It is our stuff. It is materialism. It's not just that. We'll look at some other areas of simplicity. But just think what would happen if you had to downsize. And some of you have been through that, haven't you? You've gotten to the place in your life where everything doesn't fit. All that lifetime of memories, all that wonderful stuff that you couldn't say no to before, now you have to say no to it because you're going to be living in a cubicle. And so you have to make some decisions. How much better to have made the decisions before you got there? I told my wife just today, I said, we just need to, we need to simplify things. I'm preaching the sermon early to her. She responded pretty well, so that was good. But I said, it's not a question of just simplifying, because anybody can get rid of stuff. It isn't just about calling goodwill and saying, now I've got a simplified life. It starts with our attitude, and we're going to look at that in Matthew 6. The key to simplification is found in this text, because it's, it's a change in what we seek and what we desire. You know, if I had a flood in my basement, a lot of things that I think I cannot part with, I would part with. This last week, we had some fun with sewage issues. And there was stuff in the basement that was affected by that little eruption, ongoing eruption. And instead of saying, I think I'll try to salvage this, you know what I did? I got a big garbage bag, and out it went. And I, was, I wasn't the least bit sad about that. I was glad to see it go. I almost want to put it in somebody else's dumpster so that they could be the one with that aroma instead of ours. But you know what I mean? If something happens, a tragedy, and, and something, maybe a fire, oh, how terrible that would be, and for sure, right? But if we had a fire that didn't hurt us, maybe some of the stuff 
we've realized we could live without it. Do I really need 14 blue pairs of pants? Because after I get the one dirty, my wife washes it. Maybe she shouldn't wash for two weeks and I can wear the rest of them. But I go and I buy clothes. I get them at Salvation Army, so I'm saving money, Lord. I get a good deal. It's 69 cents sale on Saturdays from 5 to 7. But I'll get the shirt and I'll say, isn't this great? And my wife says, yeah, it's just like the other five you have. And she's right. And I didn't know that. But if I liked it before, I'm consistent. I still like it, but I have the archives in my closet. And so I don't need them. Am I wealthy? Well, no, I'm not wealthy. I'm not wasteful. But I am, which I hate to say it, but I'm almost a hoarder. And so we have this issue, do we not? And Matthew chapter 6 really helps us with that. 625, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Father, help us to study the scripture together. Help us to have a real conversation together. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Father, may we not just go through the process of listening to another lecture slash sermon. Father, may we actually do business with you today. Please work in our hearts. Please help us to see where the things apply to us. Please help us to, to desire the discipline of simplicity so that we can live a life that pleases you. May we, may we be focused on the most important thing and not distracted by the many others. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want you to see here then is that there's proof that we're not living a life of simplicity. And the proof comes in the first few verses. The proof that you're not living a life of simplicity is that you worry. And if you are worrying, you're not trusting. Here we go. I'm having a little trouble, Stephen. There we go. The proof that we're not living a life of simplicity. Verses 25 to 32. Um, we know that we're not living the simple life when we worry, when we have anxious we have anxiety in our hearts because anxiety proves duplicity, not simplicity. Faith, peace, calm proves simplicity. We can all relate to this. I, would, I believe that worry is the most commonly committed sin in the church. Would you agree with me? We know we're not supposed to do the big bad stuff, but worry, boy, it's hard to, to avoid that. And we say it's concern, because concern sounds more spiritual, but it comes from the same word, my friends. Concern, anxiety, worry, these things are not pleasing to the Lord, and they're not healthy for us. And he says here that we should not, should not worry. So if I'm worrying about something, follow me here, if I'm worrying about something, I am not trusting God in that particular area. Because if I was trusting, oh, I'm, I might be trusting him over here, but I'm not trusting him here. Now think about this. I trust God to save my eternal soul, but I can't trust him for clothes? Does that make any sense at all? I, I'm trusting him. Otherwise, I'd be concerned about my salvation. But my conversion, oh, I know God takes care of that, but I'm not sure what I'm going to wear this week. Doesn't even make sense, does it? So in the area of my worry, that's the place where I'm not living a simple life, a life of faith and trusting in the Lord. And I think we can all can relate to it. Now, the word worry comes from an old German word, which means to strangle or to choke. That's a very graphic picture of worry. Worry mentally and emotionally strangles us. Now, I want you to look at this picture for a moment. This dense fog, extensive enough to cover seven city blocks, 
a hundred feet deep. So picture a fog, maybe come over to Chicago, a big city, and you've seen pictures where it's just, I think this might be New York on that one, but the fog is coming up, and all of that terrible uh, fog that you can't see through, it's like pea soup out there. Do you know that that is one, one cup of water? One cup of water divided into 60,000 million droplets can give you that right there. One cup of one glass of water. In, in the right form, just a few gallons of water can cripple an entire city. And so too, a little worry can cripple a soul, can poison a family, can hinder a church, can hold back a community, because all it takes is a little bit, and then it becomes a, a, a large bit. And the more we think about that, we get more and more upset, and our eyes get bigger, and our faith gets smaller, and all of a sudden we're not moving anywhere because we're paralyzed by fear. Now, you know what happens. You know what happens in your life. You know what happens with your kids. We've all been through that. Those of us that have children have had times when despite our best desire to trust the Lord, we were just worried sick because we couldn't stop the, the, the sound of the baby. Maybe the baby was choking. Maybe there's something going on. There's a, a you know, bleeding. When I was uh, growing up, I had a problem with nosebleeds, and I had a nosebleed. It was so bad, and my Parents called the doctor. They didn't have med centers, right? They didn't have 1-800-ASH-NURSE. They didn't have um, 800 numbers. They didn't have internet. And they called. They got a hold of the doctor. And he said, nobody has ever bled to death from the nose. So my parents said, oh, that's fine. Then go ahead. Just put him back to bed. He's not going to bleed out. No, of course they did. They said, well, thanks, doctor, but he's, he might be the first one. Right? I mean, you worry because you can't do anything about it. And we all say as parents, oh, Lord, let me get sick and not the baby. We're visiting Tim and Joy and little Noah. Noah would cough up some, some stuff, and he's just three months old, and he's an itty bitty three-month-old. And you just want to clear your throat for him, you know? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, give me a cold, but not, not him. Because that's the way we are. I and mean, we do have times that we, we're just concerned, and it's a little bit, and it gnaws at us. And we're so busy focusing on the thing that gnaws at us that we're not doing the thing God wants us to do over here, which is at the end of the text. So why is worry a waste of time? Because it's unnecessary. Verse 25 and 26, we see that God takes care of us. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or wear. Look at the birds of the air. And I picture Jesus out with the disciples. I don't think they were inside a, a room like this. Maybe they did and they had a, the, the ceiling opened up, but I doubt it. I think it was just they were out there and that's the way Jesus taught. He said, look at the birds of the air. And he said, God cares for the birds of the air. Doesn't he care more for you? It's unnecessary, entirely unnecessary to worry because God takes care of us. He says here, do not worry about your life. And the word life is the all-encompassing term. It means life in its fullest sense, everything. He says, your father knows. That's a relationship. He's not the creator only, he's my father. Now, God created birds, but he's not their father. He doesn't say the birds' fathers, right? He said, your father. There's a difference between us and the birds. Now, it's not saying that birds don't spend time feeding themselves, don't they? In fact, I did a little study about this. Many birds spend the greater part of their time and energy finding food. It's not that you shouldn't look for food. It's not that you shouldn't work. It's not that you shouldn't be faithful. It's that you shouldn't worry about that. Birds don't worry. They just do what they do. And they bring the food home for the babies and so on. And he says, why do you worry if the birds don't? I mean, they don't sit there worrying about where the next meal is going to come from. Why do we? Are we not of more worth than the birds? So worry is, is wasted effort because it's so unnecessary. God's protecting us. Do you believe it? Then stop worrying. Secondly, because it's useless. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? When I was young, I was not as tall as I wanted to be, and that was one of my verses. I thought it was talking about how, how tall you are, because stature, and it can mean that. As I was studying more, it can also mean the length of your life. So it could be your height or the length of your life, but either way, it's wasting our time because I can't do anything about it, right? I mean... I am what I am. It's already packed into the genes. I have the, the, the 1958 model equipment and nothing's going to change that. I can't be taller because I, I want to be. I can't live longer because I want to be. You can't worry about things over which you have no control. The healthiest person on the planet can be hit by a car on the way to the fitness center. 
And sometimes the people that die, they look like they should have lived forever. And the people that live forever, it seems like, boy, you wonder how they got past 50. Because we, there's no guarantees. There's no expiration date on, the, on our ankles. It's useless to worry about things that you can't change. God has bounded our lives. He's given us a beginning and an ending, and only he knows what that is. And so why would we worry? You know, you can worry yourself to death, but you can't worry yourself to life. And worrying will not make you live longer. It just might make you live shorter. So why would we waste time worrying about the things, and we've all got different ones, maybe it's not height, length of life, there's things that you cannot change, leave it alone and give it to God. It's also wasted never because it, it's a, a proof, a sign of unbelief. Jesus now points to the surrounding lilies of the field, and I think that was a general term, use of the wildflowers that grow on the fields and the, and the hillsides at Galilee. I don't think it was only lilies. I think it was wildflowers, if you look at the, the, the word there. It's talking about great variety and great beauty. And they're just decorations, right? What do flowers do? You can't build a house with flowers, right? And if you step on them, they're gone. The Bible here says that you stick them in the oven tomorrow. So they're just decorations of nature that God has given to bless his people, and they're beautiful. But they have no say in their color or their design. And even Solomon, who was one of the most resplendent kings the world has ever known, was not clothed as well as the simple hills of Galilee. Any child can grab flowers from the field. In fact, my grandkids grab them from the flower garden sometimes and bring them into grandma, right? But, I mean, they're, they're easy. They're there. They're pretty. You grab them. They have a wonderful smell. But they're common. They're normal. They're, there's nothing special about them, and yet they're very special. They don't last very long, verse 30 says. But if God bothers to array the grass of the field with the beautiful but short-lived flowers, how much more will he clothe and care for his very own children who are destined to live eternally? I mean, you know, think about it. If we thought it through, we wouldn't worry ever because he must love me a lot if he would give me all that he's given me. I believe worthy is nothing less than, worthy, worry is nothing less than a refusal to trust God. And so our destiny is in his hands. Let's put our days in his hands as well. And then it's also it's unbecoming. Verse 31 and 32, he says here, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now, that's an interesting expression, isn't it? The Gentiles, the word Gentiles is ethnoi, from which we get ethnos, and ethnographic things and so on, ethnicity. And it literally means peoples. Um, the, the peoples of the earth. But here's the reference to unbelievers. And there were times in the New Testament when the Gentiles were given as those over against God's people. And here it's talking about those who've not come to Christ. It's the ethnos. It's those who are without Christ. And it says, it's those who have no hope in God. And if you have no hope in God, you naturally place your hope in the things you can enjoy right now. Because what? That's all you've got. If you don't have a relationship with the God of the universe, if you don't have an eternal destiny that's secure, then all you have is the stuff around you. And you might as well follow the Old Testament uh, man who said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But he says, that's not what you're made of. That's not what you're destined for. You're part of God's forever family if you've trusted in Christ. And so he says, it's unbecoming for you to act as if you have no God when you have a God who loves you. In fact, he's saying, when you worry, when you beat yourself into the ground, when anxiety takes over your life, you are actually living as if you were uh, an, an agnostic or an atheist. You're living as if there is no God. And it's unbecoming for a believer. You see, the problem is when you think like the world, you worry like the world. So if you're thinking just about the things that I can see and touch and taste and so on, then you're, you become worldly in a way you wouldn't have thought, perhaps. So the proof that we're not living a life of simplicity is worry. And please take a moment to look at your own life, because I don't know what you're feeling. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm just saying, in general, I know that worry is a problem. Uh, I've never met a person who, who didn't have some problem with worry at some time in their life. And I want you to ask, God, is there something in my life that I'm worrying about? Please help me to trust you there. 
is there one part of my life, not, not all these parts, but there's one area perhaps, would you please help me to see that? Because the one thing that I whine about is the one area where God is working. You know, if God's not bugging me in some area, we're just cool, everything's fine. As long as I get what I want, I'm good. You know, aren't we that way? But then God says, this is something I want you to do. When you get a review from your boss and they say, you're good here, you're good there, you're amazing here, we can't do without you here, we do have one little problem with you here. What do you focus on? The good, the good, the good, or the ugly? Instead of saying, well, thank you, you just about said I was amazing and stupendous and the best employee ever. What do you mean I was late once last year? Stop picking on me. You know, we, we focus on the one thing. We need to stop focusing on the one thing. We need to look at the larger thing that God has for us. Now, what is the provision for that? And that's what we're here to talk about. Not to say we're worriers, because guess what? We're worriers. But there's a provision to live a life of simplicity. And it's here in verse 33. And you may not have seen it as such before we looked at it today. But there's a central point for the discipline of simplicity, and that's verse 33. But, in contrast to worry, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's it. That's the one, word, one sentence sermon. That's what I want you to take home with you today, if nothing else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, if you're living a life of concern and worry, if you're a bit superstitious, if you're overly cautious in life, the answer is to simplify your life. And it doesn't mean just get rid of stuff. It means, now here's the thing, it means to focus on seeking God. You can get rid of all your stuff and still not be focusing on God, right? The goodwill guy can be your best friend. We get phone calls all the time now. We take stuff to Goodwill. We take stuff to Salvation Army. We take stuff, to, we got a lot of stuff. We go to other places. Now the, I forget, it's some other group, if it's the, uh, oh, one of those other diseases. Anyway, they call and they say, if you, come, you, know, you have stuff for us, we'll come, put it out at your door, at your uh, curb, and we'll pick it up. We'll leave a receipt. So we had someone the other day, I forget who it was, Judy deals with that stuff. But that doesn't make me simplified. That doesn't mean that I'm seeking God. It just means I'm getting rid of stuff. So the focus isn't on getting rid of stuff. The focus is on doing the right thing with God, and then you'll be able to get rid of stuff because you, you'll, you'll hang on to it lightly instead of grasping onto it. Uh, the other day, Wednesday night, the family came in. Uh, Peter and Destiny brought the kids for our small group on uh, Back to Basics, and then I have a bunch of rocks in my office. I don't know why I do this. I go to the beach. Uh, I, don't know, I know why I do that. But I, I walk along the beach and I find the most beautiful stones. I know they're the most beautiful stones because they jump out at me and say, I'm a beautiful stone. You know what I found about stones? They're a lot prettier wet than dry. Anyway, I, have, I put them in my office. I tried to keep them wet. I put them in a, a thing of water. And guess what happened to the water? You science majors know it evaporated and they were dry, ugly again. But anyway, I got all these stones and someday I'm going to polish them up. And it seems like every time I go, I pick up more rocks. There might be a law against that. I, I might, you know, visit me in jail sometime. Are we, are we allowed to take him from the beach? But they look wonderful, and, I'm, and I run back, and I'm running. It's kind of funny to see me running with these heavy weights. I'm not kidding. It's, it's pretty silly looking. But anyway, I have all these rocks, and, and she grabbed one because she's got a good eye, and she thought, boy, Grandpa's got this great taste in rocks. And she had this rock, and she, I had a little, little uh, canning jar. And she dropped it in there. And that was so cute. Then she reached in and she wanted to take it out. Well, of course, she couldn't get her hand out. Why? She was doing this. And I'm saying, let go, honey. Grandpa's rock. Let go, honey. <laughs> let go of the rock. And isn't that the way we live our lives? You know, you, you can get in, you can get your hand in, and there's things that are okay, but if I hang on to my things and they're that important to me, all of a sudden I can't live the life I need to live. I need that hand. The only way for her to get her hand out is to let go of the rock. And that's the, that's the message for us. The only way to really be living a life that pleases God is to not cling to the stuff. It's not wrong to have stuff, but it's wrong to cling to it. It's not wrong to provide for your family, but it's wrong to make that your end in life and to worry about it that you haven't done it enough or done it perfectly or whatever, whatever it might be. So I want you to see this first thing must be our priority. 
Everything hinges on maintaining first things as first. As we become nothing before God, we learn to keep silent, and in this silence, we are able to hear him and to see him. And verse 33 tells us, seek first the kingdom of God. If you're not doing that, then you're not doing what you need to do. So stop doing second, third, and fourth and come back to the basics, all right? Every day, I think we should say, Lord, am I really seeking you first and your righteousness today? That's not a lesson that you learn and then move on to the next one. This is a life lesson that you have to keep on learning because we're surrounded by stuff. Now, if you lived in the bush country, and I've just visited there on mission trips and so on, they had nothing, nothing. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'd never been in a situation like that. People, people lining up at the one well, and they didn't have a pump. They had to put the, um, something on a rope, and they'd bring up the water, and they're, they're lined up in the morning to get their little bit of water. And they put that in these jugs and they put it on their head. This is in Mozambique. And off they go. And, and a few hours later, they're back getting the next because they need that for the next meal. And they were out there cleaning their yard, their floor. Their floor was dirt. So they found a, an old bush or something and they're sweeping. And the dogs were running through the area. The dogs would run through and they would just come behind sweeping the dirt. I couldn't even relate to that. I live in opulence. I'm a, I'm a millionaire compared to that. And I need to focus on what is most important. And I felt that they had it easier for them, I think, to do that. And I need to be able to do that, to, to, to not look at the things around me, but to have the discipline of simplicity, which re involves removing anything and everything that distracts me or clouds my vision so I can focus on this one thing. So don't simplify, seek, because when you seek, you'll simplify. That's the point I'm trying to get to. It is in the seeking that you are enabled to do your simplifying. A call to goodwill is not what we're talking about. Simplifying is the result of seeking, not the cause. Now it says here, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's not a geographical territory, it's a dominion. God's kingdom is his sovereign rule. So he's saying, seek first God's rule. Seek first God's will. Seek first God's authority. Lose yourself in obedience to the, to the Father. Pour your life into what pleases Him. Share the gospel. Live for Jesus. Yearn for His return. These are aspects of seeking first the kingdom of God. And, and if, you're, if you're focusing on seeking the kingdom of man, you won't be able to seek the kingdom of God because you can't do the one with the other. It's one or the other. When you seek first the kingdom of God, Certain things happen, certain attitudes result. First of all, you will see everything that you have as having been provided by God. Now think about that. All the stuff you have is God's gift to you. And sometimes we think, well, I bought it, or I earned it, or I inherited it, it's mine. But no, everything you have is a gift from God. Every breath that you take, every step that you're able to take, everything comes from God. And we know that because if God stopped being God, we would all fall over dead. We would have nothing. So everything you have, James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variation nor shadow of turning. How many gifts? Every gift. Every good gift, every perfect gift, life, new life, breath, health, intelligence. Don't brag about your intelligence. I'm glad you went to school. I'm glad you got degrees. We've all done this. A lot of us have done some of that. But the gray matter that God gave you, God gave you. And if I don't have it up here, I'm not going to get it going to school. So that's a gift from God. Cognizance, comprehension. These are gifts from a loving God. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did, receive, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? That's a very important verse. What do you have in your life that you did not receive? Now think about it. Nothing. Everything came because of a, a benevolent God, a powerful God who gave you those things. You did not choose your parents. You did not choose where you would be born. You did not choose how and when. The fact that you were born in this country does not make you better than the person born in Mozambique. Because God did that. What a gift he's given to us. There's nothing we have that we weren't given. And if we have not received it by our own knowledge and our own skill, then why do we brag? When you let go of things, and when you let God be God, 
You will see everything you receive as having been provided by the Father. It is known more about you, it's Him. Secondly, you will accept that what you have is protected by God. That what you have is protected. This is God's business, not ours. He cares for this stuff because it belongs to Him. You know, I take care of my own stuff, but I don't take care of my neighbor's stuff. I help out if he, if he asks for help. But that's not my responsibility because I don't own his stuff. In fact, if I go into his house and start working with his stuff, I might take, you know, a, a ride in the back seat of a police car. And so it's God's stuff in the first place. Why do we, why do we get so concerned about it? Bill Goth at one time was talking about that. He said he was driving his car. It was a car that had been given to him. He didn't make much money. He was in ministry and uh, he had the car and the car quit. I may have told you this story before. He ran out of gas or something happened. I don't know. The car pulled over to the side and he realized that he wasn't going to go anywhere. So he's saying, Lord, what can I do? I don't know much about cars and I'm stuck here by the side of the road. And suddenly he saw headlights behind him. Well, that's okay. He's on the road, but these headlights were coming on the shoulder toward him and they were coming fast. And he said, God, please help me. He said, I grabbed the steering wheel as tight as I could and I said, I'm going to wait and see what God's going to do with his car. And God gave energy to God's car, he said, and hit him and pushed him way off into the field. And he survived the wreck. He was thankful for that. The other guy was okay. He got out and he said, well, Lord, if you want to wreck your own car, it's okay with me. <laughs> That'd be hard for me to say. That'd be hard for me to do. But, you know, it happened in the past with, with John Wesley. One day when he was away from home, someone came running up to him saying, your house has burned down. Your house has burned down. To which Wesley replied, no, it hasn't, because I don't own a house. The one I have it been living in belongs to the Lord. And if it has burned down, that is one less responsibility for me to worry about. And if we could really see things that way, not in a uber spiritual, look at me, I don't care about stuff. If we can get to the place where we really are able to say, you know, naked I came into the world and naked I will leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, what a difference it would be. So that somebody hits you, and with us it's just my new car and somebody hits it with a shopping cart. Right? And that can bug me for weeks. It shouldn't. Some of us drive cars that are shopping cart magnets, you know, and everything happens to it. But it's not mine. It belongs to the Lord. Now listen, it's not a lack of faith to lock your home. Please do that. I know where you live. I know where we live. But do you really think it's the lock on your door that protects your house? Do you really think it's your precaution that really keeps you safe in life? Because if it's just my precaution that keeps me safe, I'm going to worry all the time because I forget to do things. Um, the other day we came here, I shouldn't tell you this, but uh, uh, Thursday morning somebody came to the church and the door had been left open from the night before. Deacons, please close your ears. Not a good thing, right? Last night I was driving and the, the uh, alarm detection agency called that we have at the church. So I pulled over and I answered the phone and they said, the burglar alarm went off at the church, so you want us to call the police? And I said, no, I'm on the way. I, I can stop in. It's probably, it's probably somebody inadvertently, you know, whatever. So I called John. He said, I'm not there. Okay, now I'm driving faster because there's something happening here. And so we came in, and I checked around, and I didn't find anything. The, the alarm was tripped. I don't know what happened. But, and it wasn't the day that it was open. But you know what I mean? If you're just going by my precaution and my cleverness and my ADT and my alarm system, I'm going to live in worry because... Things happen. The power goes off. Uh, the system breaks down. I forget to lock it. It wasn't me Wednesday night, by the way. But I have had my times. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's good to lock and it's good to be careful and it's not wrong to have insurance. And the Bible says the parents should lay up for their children. And it does say if you do not work, you should not eat. But the thing is, don't depend on that because that's showing the wrong sense of dependency. It is not precaution that protects us. It is God because we can't cover everything. So if we let go and let God, we will see everything received as having been provided by God. We will accept that what we have is protected by God because it's his, and this is a big one, we will allow what we have to be passed on to others. If you seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, you will become more generous. Why? Because it's not your stuff anymore. It all belongs to God. Now, we live in this closed fist mentality. And I want you to be honest with me for a moment. Even the most generous person here today, and we have generous people, even the most generous person today is not giving sacrificially. Think about it. Do you give your best? <clears throat> you keep the best. Do you give the most? 
you keep the most. Even if we're giving 10%, we're keeping 90%, right? So none of us are sacrificially giving in the sense of giving all, are we? We live in our country where we have so much. And I appreciate sacrificial giving, but I think we need to define that a little differently, really. Because when we finally recognize that God owns it all and we are just managers of what he has entrusted to us, we learn to let go and let God. We open our hearts, we open our hands, we open our houses to the needy among us. And when we make what we have been given available to others, we display a trust in God that is the real thing. If you cling to your stuff, you're showing that you're not having faith because you're fearing the future, you don't think you can replace that, you can't live without that, you're living for the moment and that's just the truth of it. But if we're able to give freely, it's just the opposite that we see. Hebrews 6.10 says, minister to the, to the saints. Luke 6.30 says, give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Now, that has to be in context, I understand that. Years ago, when I was a youth pastor in Bloomington, Illinois, I had a guy call, and um, I've told you about him. Let me just briefly remind you. He called during a service. Pastor was on the pulpit, uh, at the pulpit, so I was the associate pastor. One of the things I do was get coffee for the pastor and answer the phone. So I answered the phone. This guy said, I'm having a rough life. I'm going to kill myself over the phone, and you're going to hear me do it. Well, I was, you know, 20, 21. That was a little heady to hear that. And I couldn't say much to the pastor because he was out doing his thing. So he's going to kill himself over the phone. Well, he wasn't going to kill himself over the phone, but I, did I mention I was 21 or whatever? So I, I said, well, don't do that. And I tried to talk to him. He said, well, if somebody would meet with me, and I said, I'll meet with you. When can we meet and where can we meet? So I met with him, and um, I gave him my Bible, my, my $100 wonderful Schofield reference Bible. And he looked at it. He took it home with him, wherever home was. Or the, or the, I don't know. He came back the next day we met, and he showed me this verse. And he said, I need $200. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that. I don't have $200. And he took my Bible out and turned to this verse and he starts crossing it off. Then you don't believe this verse. And I said, don't do that to my $100 Schofield reference Bible. <laughs> this guy was a scam artist. He had me right from the beginning when he answered the phone call. I probably should have said, start shooting or something. I'm sorry, but he wasn't going to do it. I'm sorry, I don't mean that. But here was, this, here was this guy who was just going to use this verse to get something he wanted. Well, I hate to tell you that, but I ended up giving him money. And he ended up stealing it from me. And I ended up learning a lesson from it. I told the pastor I thought he'd really feel sadly. I was 21, he was 71. We agreed on a couple of things. And I told him about this, and he said, Well, you know, Doug, they get all of us once and the dumb ones twice. I wanted King James. I wanted, you know, uplifting. Basically, don't let it happen again, dummy. <laughs> so I said, well, thank you so much for that. But you know something? He was right. Like about most things, he was right. A very godly man. But what I'm trying to say is, I understand that a person can't walk up to you and say, I want your house, I want your wife, I want your kids, give it to me now. You know, that's not this. But the idea is the willingness on our part, if God is saying to me, I'm at, a, I'm at a, a, somebody has a need and I have a $5 bill and a $20 bill and I'm going to give them the five and God says, give them the 20. I need to be open to that. Because then he's also going to say, give them the five too. I need to be open to that. But Lord, I was going to buy this with that. Give them the 25. I'm, I'm worth 20 bucks, aren't I? Don't you have conversations sometimes where you know you're supposed to do more? Oh, I've had times where, I, and later I said, Lord, I should have listened to you because I can lose 20 bucks easily. I, I want us to be responsive and open to the Lord. And if we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we'll want to help others. I see paying my bills differently. I see my bill paying as an opportunity to help somebody else put food on their table. And that took me a lot of years to get to that point. We used how much electricity this month? You know, after all my turning off lights and whether people are still reading in their rooms. But now I say, well, someone else needs that. Let me, maybe I can help them out. Here's an interesting verse. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians for a moment. It's actually verse 28 that I want you to... Ephesians 4, 28. But I want you to see this first because it gives us one of the reasons for wealth. Do you know part of the reason that you're working is so you can help others? I mean, that's what the Bible says. That's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? Not the only reason. People are supposed to work, but there's people that can't work, right? There's people... Where's the safety net I've heard so much about? It's fraying around the edges. Maybe you're the safety net. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, talking about our past, 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that's so far we agree, why? That he may have something to give to him who has need. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, not just so that he can have a nicer house and a bigger car and more to eat, but that he may have something to give to him who has need. Part of the purpose of work is to help others who can't work. Did you know that? Part of the purpose of wealth is to help somebody else. And if I'm hanging on to my wealth, then I'm in trouble. But if I'm willing to give that, it shows that my, I've simplified my life. Now, this one thing carries a basic promise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Needed things. God's promise to meet our needs, not our greeds. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so we have this promise that God will take, out, take care of us. So chill out and let God meet your needs. God has your back and your front and your sides and your top and your bottom. This one thing will inform all of our daily practices. It, it'll, it is a promise attached. It's a priority for us. It'll affect our spending. Instead of buying things to be seen of men, we'll, we'll buy to meet a need. And we'll enjoy what God has given to us. You know, Jesus is not advocating poverty. Wealth is part of God's blessing. It's, it's what you do with it, right? And it's what you do about worrying about it. I love 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. It doesn't say not to be rich. If you know some, I would say if you're rich, but I know you too well. If you know somebody who's rich, don't, that's not a sin. Just com command them not to be haughty, not to depend on that, right? Not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Look at the last part. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. God wants to bless us. God doesn't want us to eat pork and beans all the time. God doesn't, God's not a ramen noodle God. I mean, there were sometimes, he, it's not wrong for us to, I'm not saying that. Don't put me in that commune thing where we all sit around there and give everything we have and just have nothing. I, I'm not saying, that's not what God's advocating. He's talking about where your heart is. He's talking about your treasure. And he's saying, make sure that you treasure me and not the things you have from me. Because if you treasure me, I'll give you more stuff to remind you of me and you can richly enjoy them. So it affects our spending. Don't trust in wealth, don't use it for show, and don't hoard it. You know, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, let me read that for you, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, very familiar passage. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Isn't that a wonderful passage? Lay up, when it says lay up and treasures, those are the same word. They both mean treasure. Literally he says, do not treasure up treasures for yourself. And the picture here is of stacking or laying something out horizontally, like stacking coins. I, I picture Ebenezer Scrooge stacking up all his coins. This is wealth that's not being used, stockpiled wealth that is kept for the keeping's sake, to make a show of affluence, or to give you security, or to create an environment of overindulgence. Yes, parents are responsible to save it for their children. Yes, hard work is rewarded. Yes, doing our best is encouraged. And being poor is no more spiritual than being rich, but we should focus on stockpiling treasures in heaven, not have treasures on earth. How do you do that? By using what you have to serve others and further the kingdom. He's not telling us to put our treasure in the right place. He's telling us that it's an indication that our treasure, where we put our treasure, is showing where we have our heart. So if I'm spending all my time and all my money here, then I'm living too much for here. Check your checkbook and see what you're spending it on, and that'll tell you everything you need to know. It has to do with our spending and with our speaking. Simpli simplicity of speech. Um, what does it say in uh, Matthew 5, 37? Let your yes be yes, and you know, no. That's it. It also affects our satisfaction. Worry is the opposite of contentment, and we've been commanded to live with contentment. 1 Timothy 6, 8, having food and clothing, let us be content. And of course, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now listen, if you're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he said, I'll never leave you, you've got all the wealth you need. Because that's what you were seeking. 
Everything else is what? It's just gravy. It's just extra stuff. Take away my stuff, but give me Jesus. Right? And that's what we're doing by seeking first his kingdom. And then finally, it affects our service. The discipline of simplicity will help us battle materialism, which is a major force in opposition to God. Remember Luke 16, no, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Anybody know? Sounds like some kind of dinosaur or something. It's the Aramaic term for wealth. So you can't serve God in money, some of the new translations say. You know, Jesus condemns wealth as a rival God to him. You have one master only. And the discipline of simplicity reorients our lives so that possessions can be genuinely enjoyed without destroying us. When we seek first the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of men, we learn in all things to be content. Philippians 4.11. So would you please add to your list of disciplines as we pursue holiness in 2015? Remember the, the, arm, the uh, wristbands? Would you add simplicity as one of those, that you would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let all these things be added to you rather than you grasping for them? In your bulletin, we have a copy of Foster's Ten Controlling Principles. Um, for simplicity, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. We put it on a stock card so you can look at it. Maybe take a look at that and see, am I buying, am I living like that? Just a little help. Lord, help us to live profoundly without masses of things. Let's pray. Father, please free us up from stuff. Please liberate us from the need to have more. Please help us to be content with what we have, and who we are. It's not that we shouldn't strive to, to, to live a better life for you. It's, it's not that we're not growing in grace and the knowledge of thee, but we're talking about stuff. We're talking about things. We're talking about what we drive and what we eat and what we wear and, and, and all those things, Father. And I understand that it's normal to worry, but that's only if you don't have a God who takes care of you, and we do. So, Father, help us not to think like the world, because then we're going to worry like the world. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, to make you our overriding concern, because all these other things will be added to us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.